All right. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks for joining. I hope we can all see me, hear me. Um, this is good morning for me. I'm in New York, uh, but you know, good afternoon for, for those of us who are outside um, the US. Elsa is our host today, and you know, she'll be monitoring uh, the chat and uh, the Q&A. So hopefully we'll have you know, five minutes or so um, at the end of the session for some Q&A. So you can add those questions there. All right, so let's get started. Um, I'm Logan Tobias, uh, lead product designer at DocuSign. And I've been designing for almost 10 years, not quite. Um, and I spent uh, the last six or seven in the B2B space. And this is kind of a definition I've been working on that time. Um, between my, my work as a consultant at Salesforce and a product designer at DocuSign. So we're gonna to try to and define sales design, which is a type of, of service design with its own best practices. So let's start with some definitions here. There's a lot of definitions out there of service design. So let's just take an NNG inspired one to start. It says service design is an exercise that enables employees to deliver a better customer experience. So this is pretty lofty or quite a large definition. And if we put some constraints on it, we'll get our sales design definition. So sales design is an exercise that enables sales to deliver a better buyer experience. So why the constraints? Why would we focus on sales and not the whole service? And that's because sales is a bottleneck to the core service. So if we perfect a service that nobody uses, that kind of stings, right? Like all that work is lost. Um, and we want people to use our, our nicely designed things. But often there's a barrier to enter that great service or software as a service. And you know, it's our job as sales designers to kind of untangle that. So when designers focus on sales, we make good metrics go up and bad metrics go down, which is one way of saying that uh, we increase revenue, which is at least what sales wants out of this exercise. I think though what, what designers get out of this exercise is more people using their service and hopefully more delighted people um, if our service removes friction from their day. So we need designers to practice sales design um, when they're consultants like at McKinsey Co and other consultancies like that, because they're often contracted to come in and change process by design. Uh, but we also need product designers to practice sales design when sellers are their primary user base, which happens a lot at companies like Salesforce and DocuSign and others. And then the last category is probably the biggest, really includes most of us. And this works for any product that has a sales funnel in front of it. So basically, if your marketing website's primary CTA call to action is request a demo or contact sales, practice sales design too. So here's some sales roles for context. Um, within sales, we kind of have two big categories, pre-sales and post-sales. And post-sales naturally flows into service. So the lines of sales and service kind of blur there. And pre-sales is where this bottleneck truly sits. So we're gonna be looking at enabling the roles on the left, the account execs, the solution architects, and the sales reps. And then for some process context, here's like an ideal sales process. Um, by no means does every company follow this, even though they probably should. We, we typically only see maybe the first half of this being followed, which is the funnel. Um, but we wanna see nowadays is this hourglass shape. So as a seller, you'd start with a lot of leads and try to push them through to sale. And by definition, most of these leads don't result in a sale, but some of them do. You then continue to nurture that buyer 
and make sure they land safely with your onboarding crew. And if all goes well, you can cross sell them later with other offerings. And then best case scenario, they'll become an advocate of your offerings and tell their friends, which again, fills the top of the funnel. And this kind of hourglass sales motion is supported with a number of SaaS products, software as a service products. So at, at your company, your sellers may receive leads a, from a marketing tool like MailChimp. They may enter in data and track the entire sales motion in a CRM, a customer relationship manager tool like Salesforce, and then send out a contract from DocuSign to close that deal. Then the implementation crew may use Jira, support may use Zendesk. The sales team, again, may run analytics on a tool like Power BI to cross sell existing customers. And then uh, marketing may try to gain customer accolades with a tool like Podium. So each company uses a different mixture of these products or their competitors to varying degrees of success. Okay, so let's get into what sales design looks like if you're a consultant. And consultants help one client at a time. So they'll ask themselves, how can I level up my client's sales maturity? And they'll kind of take this uh, Gordon Ramsay approach. So he'll come in to taste the food and get a sense of the experience and then rate the food against his high standards and work with the restaurant to kind of change everything that's broken. And consultants will run a sales design process in a similar fashion. So essentially they'll, they'll rate the sales org against their high standards, build intangible and tangible things. And those things change culture and the sales team's output. So what are our high standards? So sales can be rated on different levels of maturity. Uh, there's a lot of different maturity scales out there, but this one is process, tech, culture, and influence. And that's going to be like our salt, fat, heat, and acid, right? So if we're like a food critic. And these levels are tiered, which means if their process and technology becomes mature, they can then level up their culture and focus on how they influence the rest of the company. So when we rate process maturity, we're asking, are their business processes efficient and working for the user? And then can management accurately forecast incoming earnings with some follow-ups? Are they qualifying leads? And are all the teams using the same qualifications? If not, they won't have a clean and vetted pipeline. Then are all the teams using the same stale stages? Because if not, they're probably manually forecasting. And then are all their processes built into the CRM? So if not, they're probably using a bunch of rogue Google spreadsheets and surveys to conduct internal business. And on the spectrum of process maturity, we kind of go from everyone doing their own thing to one clearly defined process that everyone uses. And as a designer, we plot where the company sits and get them to move toward a consistent process. And if you're thinking, you know, hey, I'm in design ops or research ops, res ops, um, and that sounds like what I do for my team, aren't sales ops folks doing this as well? And the, the answer is they're supposed to, right? But they typically aren't experienced experts. So there's probably some sales ops team there that's either perpetuating confusing processes or they're too bogged down uh, with putting out sales fires to change anything at a high level. And I've noticed this, this just happens a lot when sales ops doesn't report to IT. They typically report to the head of sales, um, which means they aren't empowered to build any process rigor in those internal tools. So they may, may, may be the ones who actually spin off pseudo processes with a Google survey or spreadsheet. Um, so, so here's where our first section of the definition comes in. Sales design is an exercise. So what's the exercise? So first we need to understand the process. 
And these usually aren't too well documented. Uh, they may take a few intake workshops with SMEs, subject matter experts, uh, to kind of get close. Then we use observational research in the field with sellers to see what they're actually doing, right? Because what someone says they're doing and what they are actually doing don't always match up. And then once we get a clear picture, we get to craft our point of view, meaning we'll get to measure it against our high standards. And if our, uh, the next thing we do is like our standards will inform the guardrails of this co-creation workshop uh, to come up with a new process with the same crew. So the SMEs and sales partners, et cetera. And then once there's an agree upon vision, it's our job to convince higher ups like heads of sales or regional leads or sales ops to change process. And a lot of times that convincing motion happens with tools that we're used to using like prototyping tools, which means it's also our job to create some tangible design that evokes the new process. So as an example, a current sales process may say, deals over $100,000 need to go to a deal desk as an extra step because those deals are big enough to get extra support on the deal, which sounds simple enough, but maybe the mechanics are broken, which means the seller may have to copy paste data from a spreadsheet into a Google survey then the deal desk grabs data from the survey output spreadsheet and sends an email to the seller. And then they work out a time to get a calendar invite. And then the seller has to upload some attachment to the invite. And then they finally meet and have a messy in-person meeting because they're doing all the context switching on different tools in that meeting. So after a designer comes in, we can scrap all that and we can build all these processes into the CRM which is where sales sits most of the day and make sure that no one has to rekey any data so that the two parties can just meet, look at the same record and run a cleaner meeting or potentially maybe we automate the whole thing so that they can get to the outcome faster, right? Which is the real job to be done here. Um, then once designers set up structures like this, they can scale that design. Uh, to kind of any any time a deal may have to go to another committee and kind of streamline those multiple processes with the same design foundation. So the next is tech technical maturity. And here we're asking, are the technologies enabling the user to stay in the field and close quickly with some follow-ups? Do sellers find feel that they can find the, the information they need in one place? Do they have to enter in the same data in multiple places? And when they're ready to send out a contract, do they have to repeat data again? And then is any mechanism built in to keep data up to date and accurate? So instead of a spectrum, we kind of grade these companies on a spider scale to see where they need the most work. And then we'll try to move them out in multiple directions at the same time. And new tech design can be pretty pretty tangible part. Um, so here's an example of when I was working with a client and my researcher and I did some observational research. And what we found was sellers were trying to organize their book of business, which is like their group of current accounts by renewal date. So just a sorting. And that was so they could see who they needed to reach out to and send new contracts to or see if they needed any other product add-ons at the time of renewal. And we'd watch them spend about 15 minutes just trying to organize the data. And they all had different ways of doing it, which were all very painful. So when we showed them uh, a simple design of being able to sort by a renewal countdown, they were very grateful. And this solution isn't complicated, but these tools can easily become a burden if they aren't built and used properly. So the next is integrating your CRM with a, an agreement tool like DocuSign. That can help the seller quite a bit too. So when they're integrated, DocuSign can pull data from Salesforce, like a phone number, address, loan amount, whatever, so that sellers don't have to retype them in. This saves them time and reduces clerical errors. But also the seller can spend more time on their actual job to be done, which is closing the deal. 
And if the signer does see like their old phone number on that contract, they can correct it. And when the agreement comes back into Salesforce, that new phone number will automatically get updated, which means there's now a mechanism to automatically keep data up to date and accurate. Also, when the agreement signed, DocuSign can close a deal, start an automatic onboarding process so that the seller doesn't have to do that manually. And all that work on tech turns these tools sellers use into enablers instead of inhibitors. Okay, so the next one is, is culture. And we'll ask ourselves, you know, do they coach, encourage transparency, and do they outlast churn, which is employee turnover? With some follow-ups, do they enter in data on time or do they procrastinate? Are they afraid of logging something? And are they learning from others to sell better? Uh, so here's some real quotes that I've heard that show you this behavior. Uh, the first says, you know, we'll come in on Thursdays to enter data. We call them blue court days, uh, which was like their Ethernet connection. And there's a few red flags here. One is that the data will be skewed now on when interactions are logged, which is rough when you're trying to train an AI. But what's worse is that dealing with the system is homework for the reps. And we want a system that, that helps them and organizes them, but instead it's the opposite. They perceive the system as a compliance tool. And the second is, I don't enter red accounts into the system, it might affect my bonus. So red accounts are the ones that have hinted they're gonna stop paying you and cancel their contract. And this fear of entering that in makes it so reps don't get the help they need on the toughest deals or the toughest accounts. And then the last one is, I'm not learning from others on how they're winning deals. So there's no playbooks or helpful information that's built into the system. And cultures that don't teach best practices don't outlast churn. So changing culture is pretty intangible, but here are some things that can kind of move that culture along. Uh, mobile app support is necessary for this crew. And that may sound like a given to us, but often every time, you know, somebody is gonna need a reminder on this about specific mo mobile features. So for instance, if you call your contact directly in a CRM, um, after you hang up, it'll prompt you to enter in notes about that call which is oftentimes what the data that the sellers are entering into the system is interactions with the client. And sellers won't need to wait till Thursday to enter that in and they can stay in the field. So these timely logs are gonna really help um, when we talk about training AIs um, to look at all these, these timely patterns. And the next is to reduce fear. Um, these are all examples, by the way, but we need to measure uh, the right things. So if sellers are docked for red accounts in their book, they just aren't gonna enter them in. So that means that this KPI or key performance indicator is not a, what we call what's in it for me driver. So instead, if we rewarded sellers for recovered accounts, they would enter in those red accounts sooner. And the what's in it for me question is answered immediately by being rewarded for the chase and also getting assistance. Because with that entry, management can step in and help with that account. So the actual customer issue, which is the real problem here, right? The real job to be done can be solved sooner. Also focusing on what management sees is important. So they need a view of the hygiene of their pipeline so that they can step in more. Because they typically only hear about deals that are struggling on you know, in one-on-one -on -one meetings with their direct reports. So if we showed them deals that were taking too long or had a lot of inactivity or had their close date pushed out or missed their close date entirely, they could step in to find out what's going on. And lastly on learning, I don't think it's the designer's job to come up with sales playbooks. It's important that those come from the field but we can surface those tips in an interface. Um, so Salesforce, other CRMs, they have a section for this at each stage of the deal, but it's often left alone as like a default message. 
So our researchers and, and we can do some quick user interviews with top sellers to find out you know, what they're doing to win deals. And we can put those tips in the interface here. And that's how these orgs can outlast employee turnover because those top sellers won't be employed there forever. Okay, then the last one's influential maturity. And we'll ask, is the sales org course correcting and are they influencing other parts of the company? With some follow-ups, do sellers trust the system? Are closed, lost, and re one reasons shared? And are they using AI correctly? So on this road to influential maturity, we've gained process, tech, and cultural maturity. And now we're looking at a really a top tier order. And what they'll do is they react to data they, they've created and use it to course correct themselves. Then they'll share things like close one or lost data to product, pricing, marketing, so that those other groups can course correct too. And then finally, they'll, they'll use AI correctly so that they can see things that humans cannot see. And they'll use it to predict, correct, and share out info. And here's what that looks like. So analytics can help managers kind of compare open deals um, against historical time and stage. And if, if a sales org is averaging slower on a specific stage, they can step in and investigate why they're off track and fix things. They can also find out what stage buyers are dropping out of the most so that uh, management can also course correct any processes that may be messed up in those stages. So they're taking control of their process design. Um, but these metrics will only be accurate if sellers are entering that data in early and often. Another way analytics can help is um, can help sales is by showing those cross sell opportunities that weren't inherently obvious. So a well trained AI can tell a seller what deals they're likely to win or lose even before they happen. And that's based on many things like the buyer's current portfolio and how smooth past deals went. And then AIs can also score the health of an individual deal based on the buyer's interactions with marketing material and the seller's interactions with the system. And if the seller's interactions slow down on entering activities, for example, the score will drop. And then when, when sales orgs close one or lost data is shared out, we all win. So when pricing is adjusted, sellers win. When marketing highlights winning features, sales gets new leads. And when product closes feature gaps, sales gets to re-engage those closed loss deals. All right, so that was like sales design for consultants in a nutshell. If you're looking for more examples on each of those levels, I've written an article on that with a few more tips that's up on Medium. But also reach out to any business analysts or business architects on your consulting team. Uh, so they do a lot of work like this without being experienced experts per se, uh, but their roles have existed a lot longer than ours have. So they know a lot about what a, a good sales work looks like and runs like. Also, anyone with sales excellence in their title should be working on some similar material. Um, excellence is just a buzzword I'm trying to avoid, but it's spread pretty far in the sales world, so you might see that title. All right, so let's move on to some in-house product design. Remember, these are going to be designers working at companies like IBM or Salesforce DocuSign um, because sales is one of their main user roles. And this is where we focus on enabling a, a portion of sales through software as a service, as a layer. And the big question for us is focus on enabling all sales teams for all customers. And so we have to ask, how can I level up the tech maturity for companies with radically different sales motions? So we're looking back at tech maturity here. And there's typically a difference between how well a company has implemented our service and how well our product can actually operate. 
right? So our products may cover a larger area than what the customers start out with using day one, but it's our jobs to make sure every customer can expand the best they can. And the hard part for designers here is that we can't say we're exposing the right data for everyone. And we, that means we have to empower somebody on the customer side to customize that experience. And so we have to hand over control to someone like the admin. And this could be one person, depending on the size of the company, um, but it could also be a team of folks like an IT, and they could have consultants like we talked about influencing them too. And so admins themselves definitely have a maturity scale as well. And Salesforce has done some research on this topic and realized that you know, many of these people are still falling into this role accidentally. Um, but many sales designers have been designing for a more savvy admin, which can really lead to a corrupt experience. So if someone's driving a, your stick shift car who doesn't know how, they could break the clutch on accident, among other things. And the same risk is here. And that risk goes down the more trained and intentional the admin is. Uh, but I, I didn't like label the Y axis too much here because even an intentional admin um, might provide a rocky experience because they, they aren't UX experts either. Um, so they, they may give us a bit of motion sickness driving that car, but it won't burst into flames. Um, so let's take a, a look at JIRA to illustrate this. So here's my, my brutal dashboard when I log into JIRA because there's about 500 pixels or less of relevant info for me on, on the screen. And there's a lot of things that I wish that were on here. You know, I kind of wanted something like this that's comments I'm actually tagged in, not random ones, so I don't have to flip back and forth from my emails to, to find them. Um, and tickets I've logged for others like UI bugs and their statuses. Those things would, would make this actually usable. But whose fault is that? You know, I used to blame the product for this, but now I know it's, it's my admin who set up this experience. So Jira may not be at fault, but they've assumed that my admin won't corrupt my experience. And what we need to do as designers is lay in such good industry best practices so that admins won't want to mess them up. Which means that we have to design for that accidental admin and try to level them up. So some ways we can level them up um, is to create some guardrails for the product so that the experience can't be altered beyond recognition and then offer product guidance when we can. And I don't mean tool tips or walkthroughs by that. I mean, surfacing best practices from the industry straight to the admin so that they can use them. Admins can also level up with training, but that's kind of outside of our scope. So here's an example of that put into action by Zendesk. And this is for their new dashboard builder. So when an admin wants to create a dashboard, Zendesk offers templates as a form of guidance. That way, Zendesk can surface a few options that they know would work in many of their user scenarios, and they can lay in best practices into those templates. So if they wanted to surface a KPI like recovered accounts instead of read accounts, they could surface that here. But also if an admin does decide to go custom, they've put in place some guardrails like snapping to a grid, and it seems like they used to not have that, which sounds like a mess, and uh, dynamic resizing. So Zendesk has done a good job here at trying to clean up their space and enable their accidental admin, knowing that you know that person is not a UX expert. All right. So now it's time for, for this last category, which should include really most of us, the biggest set of designers. And this is for sales design for any sales, uh, any product with a sales motion. And we'll focus on the last half of this definition, delivering a better buyer experience. So designers in this group need to empower uh, their sales team so they can win over their competition. 
And they'll ask, how can I stay close to sales and know my buyer? So why would we stay close? Well, as designers, we typically think a better UX wins our customers. And that can be pretty true, especially in the B2C space. But that's harder to say for, for products with sales motions. For instance, product A may have a great UX, but it's not winning like product B is. And that's because product A only works with a clean or logical process. And product B spent time making sure it integrates everywhere, no matter the experience, and is overly customizable almost to a fault. So buyers are more comfortable adopting B because of their bad practices that currently exist at their company. And it's, it's not anecdotal. I mean, this, this happens all the time. So this is a, a Salesforce competitor called Copper. And it's a really slick CRM sales tool based off material design. But it's not doing well because this is a messy space and it's designed for simplicity, which is normally a good thing, uh, except when we talk about these groups. And it only integrates well with Gmail and Drive. So there's far too many sales teams who will be using Outlook forever. Um, and Copper will never work for those teams. So here's a few tips on how to stay close to sales so that that doesn't happen to your product. And the first is creating a, a design panel. So we used to call these steering codes as consultants. And you can kind of co-create this uh, group with your researcher too. And this is a group of pre and post sales folks that you'll pitch designs to and discuss roadmap with. And they'll offer a perspective on the buyer and tell you, you know, what's working, but also what gaps they have in your product that they have a hard time selling. Um, also, some of these folks may be whispering into your PM's ear on a one-on-one -on -one basis already instead of in a group setting. So if you're at all questioning you know, your PM's motives or questioning why you don't have influence over the roadmap, it's nice to get down to the source of some of that feedback. Um, also, you can make sure your PM wasn't you know, having selective hearing when they were listening to sales, right? And then on top of that, we also want to uh, shadow sales. So researchers may be doing this already too, but if you listen into a sales pitch about your product, it's incredibly valuable and you'll hear buyer reactions without that, without sales as selective hearing, right? Uh, Cause sales is bias, of course, and we can't just rely on the panel itself for them to, to tell us the truth. We have to see it. Um, there's also tools that record sales calls like Course AI. So if your company is using that, you can type in um, keywords like your, like your product um, and see how often uh, it comes up and what buyers think about it. But also sales has internal meetings uh, that are interesting to get like kind of this macro view of their success and failures, especially because they may not be so candid in their closed loss notes in a CRM if they have any closed loss notes at all, which means we can't expect sales maturity here. We have to go out and find it. Um, also, once you create those inroads, you can always ask questions informally on Slack and keep up to date on usage of features. The next tip is to find the sales metrics yourself. Um, we saw how long it took, you know, for a sales org to reach influential maturity. And it's a, a sign that your research and design org is mature if you can seek out that data and react to it. So PMs and researchers here can be particularly helpful with that hunt. And then also consuming sales content. So a lot of these sales teams are empowered with competitive research notes about the industry. And reading what sales reads quickly informs you of your entire landscape. And there may be someone in your company with the title uh, competitive strategy, kind of somewhere in their title, that's creating this content. And it's always good to start a relationship with them to dig deeper uh, with questions. And I'll leave you with this. So in the past, buyers have been the driving force for easily corruptible experiences, right? The, the super over customizable experiences. But every time I met with a buyer, they would hire me as a design consultant and say, we dug ourselves a hole 
and now we need help. We, we broke it all, basically. And so we're seeing the, the pendulum swing back to less customizable experiences, or at least ones with some guardrails, which is really nice to see. So I hope this gets everybody's thoughts jogging about how to thread that fine line between what Jira has done to what Copper has done and how that makes Zendesk really stand out in the VUB space. All right, that's it. Um, thanks everyone. I'm, I'm also on ADP list. Um, if you feel like continuing the conversation, my door's always open. Uh, and we might have a few minutes for, for a Q&A, so I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, how would someone go about a career transition in sales design? That's that's good to hear. Um, that it'd be, you know, like a. I hope one day this is a popular term, uh, but it's kind of a new term. And and what you'd be looking for is any service design roles that happen to cater to like a sales team. Um, and that most of the times I see service design stood up really well at consultancies. So you'd be looking uh, for a consulting job um, at McKinsey & Co. There's also lots of small ones if, you know, a lot of those, those higher up firms might ask for a grad degree, which may not be like, I don't have a grad degree yet either. Um, so you might want to look at the small ones, which are in like uh, tons of cities, uh, you know, offering remote jobs now. So yeah, I would, I would look at service design for sure. Uh, what teams or divisions are, are roles usually? Discussions regarding them design. Um, so sales is, is the bottleneck, um, but there are, you know, like when we think about uh, at DocuSign, we cover like a lot more teams than sales, right? We cover HR um, and the entire real estate end-to-end -end flow. Um, we cover a customer service too. So none of this work really stops at sales, but it's just, it's very focused on sales sometimes. And we're trying to get that right. But technically you need to, you need to be talking to everyone. If you're thinking about changing a sales and service end to end at a company, um, there's like no division that we're like not supposed to talk to, I guess is the answer to that. I feel like a lot of my suggestions uh, for sales are dismissed. Okay. So, right. So to, to get out of the designer um, where you could like pigeon, pigeonhole basically, um, a lot of the times we have to enter in. So this happens at basically at every consulting job I was at. I would enter in uh, a company and they would begin the conversation with something like, oh, you're just like the IT guy. You're just like the, the guy who fixes our tool and it's broken. And with all the workshop work, they start to slowly understand, first of all, like what UX is. <laughs> so there's a lot of training there. Um, and then secondly, that it's not about the tool. Like a lot of this stuff is so intangible, but we may, we may land by first talking about how the interface is broken and then ex expand out and say, look, no matter how much we update the interface, if you don't change your culture, nothing's, nothing's gonna, you know, actually change here. So we can make a nice interface, but you know, if nobody's going to use it or if your culture doesn't adopt it, um, nothing's actually going to change. So we, we may have to come in through like a software angle and then say, yes, we know a lot about interface um, and then kind of grow that idea and expand it and start touching on other topics. So I hope that that helps. Okay. I think that's that was the last question. Um, we have to jump to some other sessions. So I hope you're having a good time. And uh, thanks, thanks for joining.